Welcome to another session of the, of the Middle East Institute. Uh, I also want to, on your behalf, warmly welcome Dr. Rami Nazarallah. Uh, we will talk about him a bit later. First, uh, just uh, slight housekeeping. We have uh, our first director appointed, and uh, he's Professor Michael Hudson. Michael Craig Hudson, and he is with Georgetown University. He will be coming sometime in uh, the end of August, beginning of September. So he's in the process of uh, completing his tenure at Georgetown. And uh, once he comes, we will, of course, again uh, have a session and introduce you all to him. Today, uh, I'll be very brief because uh, our session as normal will be uh, Dr. Nazarala will present uh, his paper or his, his, his speech and then followed by questions and answers. He says that he would rather have a short session speaking to you and a longer session asking questions and answers. So I will leave that to him. I just want to say only one thing first, and that is what you all know about uh, uh, the meeting between the President of the United States and uh, the Prime Minister of Israel. Uh, this is the second time they're meeting, and you'll recall that the last one was a no meeting or a non-meeting. Hardly anything was said. Uh, it, it was more a meeting of differences, a collision actually, not a meeting. Then uh, this time round, uh, both sides have done very well to make sure that it appears to be a great success. So we had the last few days, I, at least I saw it, uh, the newspapers were discussing what kind of soup would be served during the luncheon which would be uh, given uh, the Prime Minister. The previous time, I don't think he got any soup. So uh, then this time, also again, it was both sides wanting to show that the relationship is not strained at all and things are still the same that uh, one is a great friend of the other. One thing, however, uh, no mention of the substantive issues, but it'll come. But one thing for sure, I think, uh, they must have discussed the, the peace talks, the indirect peace talks, perhaps leading to direct peace talks. And uh, I saw another report by a cynic who said that, uh, maybe he's not a cynic, who said that, uh, Actually, all these actors in the peace talks, nobody is really serious about peace. Nobody is serious enough to give up some of the things they have in order to achieve peace. And, and the, all the other players are there. Uh, you have the US, you have Israel, you have Hamas, you have the Palestine Authority, you have the refugees, so many. But the cynic ends up by saying something very interesting. He says, Perhaps the one party which is most interested in achieving peace is the U.S., and they don't know what to do, how to achieve that. So on that very happy note that nobody knows this, I will hand over to uh, Dr. Rami, who actually, whose uh, PhD is in urban planning, but he's a Palestinian, he has lived there, and. Uh, uh, this is not his first time in Singapore. When we had a seminar last year, or was it the year before last, uh, he very happily came along and we were introduced to him by my friend at the end there, Michael Vachikotis, who himself bears a rather important name, his father being a renowned uh, uh, expert on the Middle East. You have in your, with you, papers which give you the CV of Dr. Rami. Now I invite you, sir, to come and join us. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And thank you for the golden opportunity to rethink the conflict from far away from Jerusalem and the occupied territories. Uh, in my lecture, I will try to examine the internal uh, political events and dynamics that they were affected and 
affected by the conflict and the resolution of the conflict. I will avoid stating a position which sound like political or personal and try to analyze the uh, more the trends, uh, especially those have to do with the internal Palestinian politics and the way they are going to impact the peace process and which scenarios uh, can be uh, developed based on the current uh, trends and their future development. I will not go back to the long history of the conflict. I will start from the Oslo peace process and actually the end of the Oslo peace process with the first intifada in September 2000 which actually changed uh, the uh, rules of the game and it introduced a new challenge for the Palestinian cause and for the Palestinian politics. Uh, the second intifada which break down on, on, which break on September in September 2000 it actually had its own internal uh, reasons the Palestinian Authority which was established in November 94 when Arafat returned back to Gaza and later to Jericho and the say you know the day after on the 2nd of July uh, Palestinians uh, actually witnessed a different model of, uh, I will say, a ruling uh, 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 party, uh, which is quite different from their image and from their perception of the national liberation movement. First thing that the PLO applied, uh, which is far from the local culture developed uh, since 67, since Israel occupied the territories in June uh, 1967, was the, uh, what I call the classical Arab model of domination and control, and a neo-patrimonial system, which is all around uh, one leader with a personal loyalty. The whole system is based on controlling the internal security of the, of the political regime and uh, advancing the interest of a certain elite, which is directly, directly connected uh, with the elite based on loyal uh, patrimonial uh, personal loyalty and sharing the uh, benefits between brackets of the uh, re revolution and the liberation. 2000 actually was the early you know, protest of many Palestinians who were against the corruption of the Palestinian Authority. Usually the discourse of this conflict is all around peace talks, the, uh, the agreement, the lack of peace process, but hardly you can find anything related to the internal dynamics. And this was a dominant discourse among the Palestinians. The agenda was all about uh, the level of corruption and the, uh, the, the way the Palestinian people felt uh, against the, uh, this new uh, 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 political system. So it started as uh, uh, the, the second intifada started as a protest against this corruption model. Uh, that why it was not a co coincidence that it started in the periphery of the uh, Palestinian territories. Jenin, Nablus in the north, where uh, most of the refugees who were uh, totally marginalized by the new uh, political system, and they were the fighters of the first intifada in 1987. So these young people who were part of the, uh, the protest against the occupation in the first intifada was totally marginalized. And in Gaza, Rafah was the core and the center of the, uh, of the second intifada. Uh, at the early days of the first intifada, there was no victims uh, when it, uh, when it, uh, from the Israeli side. It was mainly directed against the corruption of the Palestinian Authority and Arafat was smart to direct and redirect the whole uh, uh, intifada against Israel because there is no legitimacy to fight uh, you know, each other uh, and, and, and to start with, with the civil war rather than fighting the occupation which is still dominating the Palestinian life. In addition to that, the failure of the Camp David uh, uh, negotiations, Camp David II, 
uh, because of two main reasons. The Palestinians insist not to declare the end of the conflict and the, uh, that there'll be no right of return to, the, to, the, uh, to Israel under the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the claim that uh, the Palestinian right of return is a very uh, sensitive and emotional issue and we should not declare an ending of this demand before finding a solution, before engaging the majority of the Palestinians, including those refugees, the, the, the six million refugees, uh, not the West Bankers and the Gazan who live in the occupied territories in the whole peace process. And the second reason was Jerusalem and the way uh, the, uh, the Israelis, the Americans, dealt with the issue of holy places and imposing sovereignty and recognizing the Israeli sovereignty on Al-Haram al-Sharif which was one of the major obstacles. But parallel to that, Arafat, uh, he assumed that a certain level of violence could help in a Palestinian negotiation position. And this was uh, similar to other models uh, and, and, and other conflict areas. Uh, I talked about the, uh, the, the internal, uh, you know, uh, uh, feeling uh, against the Palestinian uh, Authority, but uh, it simply uh, disappears when the Palestinian Authority get involved in the Second Intifada. So Palestinian uh, armed forces were taking part in the Second Intifada, and it, it, was, uh, it didn't take much to move this Intifada from a popular resistance, popular uh, 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 protest uh, against the Israeli occupation, uh, to engage the Palestinian security. At the first stage, they start to, uh, to uh, prevent Palestinian uh, civilians from throwing stones on the Israeli checkpoints around the Palestinian towns, but later they took part in, the, uh, uh, in this protest and they were part of the shooting. So this intifada became almost a mini war, a guerrilla war between Palestinian security forces and the Israeli army. You know, Second Intifada was, was uh, you know, was very problematic when it's come to the way uh, it listed the Palestinian objectives. There was a whole set of opinions uh, and uh, even objectives and strategies concerning this Intifada. It started with the slogan liberating Palestine through peaceful means, uh, you know, popular uh, protest. And it's also ranged uh, uh, on the other side uh, to uh, armed resistance. And there, there was the dominant uh, opinion of the PA that we should not intervene in this uh, violence because it could also uh, uh, pressure the Israeli government the way Arafat uh, uh, thought about this intifada. I will not go you know, back to history because I want to get to the, to the main uh, dynamics, to the main uh, uh, internal uh, politics of the Palestinians, uh, and the fact that Arafat uh, was uh, declared as irrelevant uh, leader uh, by Israel and by the West, it actually uh, gave him the green light for more internal uh, 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 violence uh, and at least not to stop uh, uh, you know, the violence and all these, uh, uh, you know, uh, guerrillas uh, um, in the periphery of the Palestinian towns became the dominant uh, 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 factors, political factors within the Palestinian uh, political system. Actually, the first, the second intifada, it's resulted, uh, 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 one of the main results of the second intifada was the weaknesses, the, w the, to, uh, the, the way it weakens the national leadership and the way it promoted the local street uh, uh, militias, gangs all over the West Bank, mainly in the periphery of the West Bank and Gaza. The Israeli disengagement plan, the way Sharon presented this in 2003-2004, was actually uh, uh, was a, a challenge for the Palestinian uh, leadership. Because a unilateral action uh, that they cannot uh, uh, object because it is, at the end of the day, uh, liberating between brackets uh, part of the Palestinian land. And actually, it is uh, considering the Palestinian authority 
and the PLO as irrelevant as no partner. So Israel proceeded with a unilateral uh, uh, redraw from the Gaza Strip and dismantling settlements, uh, uh, you know, uh, according to, to this plan. Arafat, when he died in, in, in November 2004, actually this was a turning point for the Palestinian politics. I think this is the end of the, uh, the classical nationalism, the liberation movement. The way Palestinians uh, demanded a national liberation, ending the occupation, and the way Arafat wanted this national movement uh, 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 to uh, achieve a, a, the, uh, uh, the national inspiration and the uh, right for self-determination. It didn't work. The Oslo peace process was an interim agreement. It actually uh, didn't change the reality on the ground. Only 40% uh, of the occupied territories, mainly West Bank, was still controlled by Israel. This is Area C. And Area C actually is fragmenting the Palestinian territories into small islands. And there's no geographic and functional contiguity between these. So in terms of t in t talking about national liberation, the national movement failed at this stage to achieve its national goals. President Abbas was elected, and actually, before he was elected, he was accused uh, of being a pragmatic, and that he g gave up uh, uh, the Palestinian right of return, and he was considered as, uh, you know, as a, a far uh, compromising uh, 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 leader. But the Fatah, uh, movement, they couldn't find, or they, he was the only option for Fatah who enjoy the international recognition. And the issue of international recognition is a major and a dominant element within the Fatah strategy. The way they are presenting themselves as the only legitimate representatives of the Palestinian people and the only recognized national movement, not only by Arab Muslim countries, but by the international community. This was a major element, and they use it all the time to, uh, to uh, uh, actually to limit the, 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 the ability of Hamas to play such a role. Telling them, look guys, you are not the recognized representative of the Palestinian people. You can't play such an international uh, uh, role. It's so complex. Uh, it will not lead you anyway because you are not recognized. And this is, was one of the major you know, packages that they used against Hamas, not only when Hamas uh, took over in 2007, but even earlier. Even when Hamas demanded from 93 to have 40% uh, uh, within the Fatah, within the PLO institutions, the, the, the argument that they used against this, that you, you, you are not uh, enjoying this international legitimacy. Hamas refused to be part of the Oslo peace process. They were against the, uh, the election held in January 96 for the first Palestinian parliament, which is the Legislative Council. By the way, the, uh, the Legislative Council was not part of the Oslo peace process because you know, the, uh, it, uh, the, the, the Oslo agreement, we're talking about a leadership of 24 representatives uh, who have the, uh, the right for uh, legislation. So there was no parliamentarian body within this uh, uh, authority, but still uh, uh, Hamas uh, were against uh, 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 candidating, the, you know, being part of this election. And the argument that they used that this election is a result of the Oslo peace process and we are not going to recognize the Oslo Accords. Since then, they, there was a lot of changes among their leadership. And actually, uh, they never show any minimum interest to express their own opinion about the Palestinian Authority. Even talking about uh, corruption within the Palestinian Authority, they never expressed any opinion. They, they, were, they, were not, they didn't care less about the Palestinian political structure. And their main slogan uh, at that time were mainly dominated by uh, resistant, by what they call armed resistant, to end the occupation. 
and they even didn't define the geography of ending the occupation. Are we talking about the whole Palestine? Are we talking about the 67 uh, occupied territories? I think Hamas identified a huge potential after Arafat died, that it is the right time to occupy the Palestinian political system. And the way they selected the right timing is, I think it was very smart from their side. You know, going back to the, to the, to the history of Hamas, Actually, Hamas was promoted and encouraged by the State of Israel, by the military uh, occupation in Gaza, and the first permit given to their top leader, spiritual leader, uh, Sheikh Ahmad Yassin, back in 1997, uh, in, in uh, 1979, uh, was given by the, uh, uh, the army commander in Gaza to, uh, to establish their Mujamma al-Islami, the Islamic compound where they have mosque, clinics, a, kinder, a kindergarten, and, and, and school, and a community center. So Israel actually thought at that time that, you know, uh, 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 in order to create a competing political power, they promoted and they uh, encouraged Hamas to compete with the PLO. The Hamas was very passive concerning Israel. They even they, they were stating uh, many times that our interest is to educate the, 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 the people. The, 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 this is the Muslim basic in the Muslim Brotherhood to educate the mass people. And then they shifted their whole strategy with the first Intifada and they established Hamas as the resistance movement in December uh, 1987. But before that, they were very passive concerning the Israeli occupation. And to a certain extent, they cooperated with the Israelis, and they were promoted by the Israelis. And we get, you know, the 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 the, the most harsh enemy of Israel, and uh, this is, you know, a result of their policy at that time. They they identify the potential of being at least equal counterpart for the Fatah with the, with the election uh, uh, after Arafat left us. So actually, we refer to the election, legislative election in January 2006 as the shocking victory of Hamas. I, th I think this is not true at all, because they, the Hamas candidates, actually, they, uh, they, 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 were, they succeeded in the local elections throughout 2005. So there was an alerting sing sing signal about the, 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 uh, you know, the way they can uh, occupy the Palestinian political system. And most of the, those who voted for Hamas in 2006, actually they voted against Fatah. It was a kind of a protest vote against uh, Fatah rather than supporting the, uh, uh, the uh, Hamas and their Islamic uh, uh, views. And by the way, Hamas managed to uh, to reshape its, its, its image and to download, actually, to, to, to actually they, they, they undermined all their fighting and resistant uh, strategy and being anti-Israel and anti-occupation. This was not part of their campaign. They came with a smart campaign talking about the need for uh, change and reform None of their top leaders, and the first, even the second circle, circle of leaders were part of the candidate list of Hamas. They were looking for the most credible leaders at the local level, like physicians, successful business people, you know, uh, imams in mosques, and they were the candidates of Hamas, both in Gaza and, 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 and the, uh, the West Bank. And actually, if we try to get you know, the Palestinian election was, uh, you know, the, uh, it was divided between the district level and the national list. At the national list, it was 50-50, because Fatah is more known at the national level uh, than the Hamas leaders, who's well-known, well-trusted within the, their communities. So they know how to serve better the communities, and they were part of a welfare system providing education, health, sport, culture, religious services to, to, to Palestinians, mainly in Gaza, because this was their main base.
I think the best case scenario was to create a balance or what, what we can call 50 to 50 victory. But they never uh, predicted this uh, uh, you know, uh, majority in the parliament uh, in the election 2006. And actually we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, that the, the, the first government after the election were, uh, they were in trouble actually. Whether they, they thought if we are going to be a second political power, you know, it was a, a, a one-party system. If it will be a two dominant organizations or two-party uh, system, they were more interested in the, in the social issues, on trying to use their model of a welfare system and to spread this beyond the Hamas-affiliated uh, framework. So, but they never wanted to be part of this challenging uh, uh, um, I mean, they, they, they never wanted to be in the front and to, ch to be challenged by uh, this need to recognize Israel and to recognize the signed agreements. It's beyond their, their, I mean, they wanted to avoid this, but they were actually facing this and formally they refused to recognize Israel. They used several arguments. One argument that 15 years of the Oslo peace process it didn't, uh, change reality on the ground, on the, in the contrary. I mean, Palestine is more fragmented, I'm talking about the Palestinian occupied territories. Economy and employment is higher than it used to be under the Israeli occupation. And the Fatah failed uh, with their peace strategy. So why we should recognize Israel and give them uh, a free, uh, uh, you know, uh, for free rather than using this recognition as part of negotiating Israel and their strategy to, uh, to get a better deal. And they, they talked about a better deal, that without creating a balance, a strategic balance between the uh, Palestinian people who can reach a better deal with, with Israel, don't waste your time. This was the, the message uh, since they were elected 2006. Uh, we have to create this strategic balance and be able to negotiate better the Israelis. In, you know, I want to move from this, uh, their first experience of the international boycott of their government and then the Mecca Accord where they, you know, uh, uh, start to, uh, in, in January to 2000, uh, 2007, and the way they start to build their uh, recognition, their international recognition, starting with, uh, with Arab regimes. And, you know, by the way, all the Hamas discourse was anti-Arab regime. It's not a democratic one. It's, it's uh, against the will of their people. They are, the, uh, they are, you know, the oppression of the uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood all around. But they started to shift and to change their language. And Hamas began talking about being part of the national movement. And the Islamic roots did not conflict with the Palestinian nationalism. The first day that they occupied Gaza in June 2007, the Hamas uh, uh, security people were raising the, the green flag. It took them less than one hour to get clear instructions by their top leaders to re-raise again the Palestinian flag and to take down the green flag because they are still representing the Palestinian people and they are part of the national uh, movement. The two actually having the photo of Yasser Arafat next to Ahmad Yassin as a background of their prime minister was uh, shocking for, for everyone that they used the national symbols and they tried to, uh, uh, to come with what I, what I call a neo-national uh, movement as being part of the whole Palestinian uh, uh, nationalism is totally new for Hamas. Because they, 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 their, their record shows in the past that they are supporting an Islamic state that for uh, uh, um, uh, implementing Sharia. And the whole discourse was an Islamic universal one and not a Palestinian one. 
but the shift took place after their victory in 2006. And they, even they denied that they are trying to uh, foster an Islamization of the Palestinian state. And they blame other uh, uh, factors within the extreme Hamas people, like the Adawa people who are not part. They said it's not reflecting our formal position. We are representing the Palestinian people, whether secular, uh, uh, religious, uh, Fatah, Hamas. We are the, the, the elected uh, representative of the Palestinian people. And they're still emphasizing this issue of being elected in a democratic uh, way in 2006. They also, Hamas, they toned down it anti, its anti-Israel tone. For a sudden, they, they even they didn't express. They talked about in general terms in a very diplomatic language, but their anti-Israel campaign, it totally stopped. Even they start to punish uh, the other groups who shoot uh, rockets in Gaza. And uh, 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 one of their main uh, goals was to achieve security and stability after they occupied Gaza in uh, June 2007. Hamas was the Palestinian faction most committed to the calm. Hamas being advocating uh, a terminology of the Hudna. They were talking about the Hudna, a ceasefire kind of Islamic uh, Hudna. And they actually uh, uh, prevented, uh, as I said before, the other uh, organizations from acting against Israel, especially from the Gaza Strip. There's certain pragmatic elements within Hamas began talking about the Turkish model of the Islamic Justice Party. This is the like the model that they were inspired by, and they are not part of the global jihad. They are not anti-West. They even from day one. Uh, uh, send a, a clear message that we want to open a dialogue with the West, Europe and the United States. And it continued to be their at least declared policy, sending letters, maybe two letters to President Obama that he never opened, but still they insist on delivering these messages and, and being part of the, uh, the, the, the new regime. They started to, to to be trying to shape a new regime, but definitely Israel and the West never recognized this uh, result of the election. First thing that the Hamas did, el eliminating the Fatah from Gaza, and the way they were against the Fatah is mainly directed against what they call the corrupt elite of Oslo um, and the preventive security. And they consider this as a revenge of the way this preventive security uh, uh, arrested them and killed some of their members, of the Hamas members, in 96. There was a campaign by Arafat that the preventive security arrested all the top leaders of Hamas, including Rantisi and Zahadi, were jailed, and many of the their, their, their infrastructure were, were destroyed by the in preventive security. So it was not a fight against Fatah the way presented, you know, uh, removing the corruption out of Gaza is uh, related more to the corruption uh, of the Fatah, less uh, the being affiliated with, with Fatah. As we know that the national on 14 of June 2007, President Abbas, uh, he dismissed the Prime Minister Haniya after the occupied uh, Gaza. And he declared a new emergency government with the former finance minister Salam Fayyad as the Prime Minister, who is still uh, acting as the uh, Prime Minister uh, today without even, and he changed the law that he don't need a, a, a majority at the parliament. There was no voting by the Palestinian Legislative Council, which is a dominant by uh, Hamas leaders. The, the Fatah, uh, they gave loyalty uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Salam Fayyad. And by the way, uh, many of the articles uh, written on Salam Fayyad, they, uh, they uh, affiliated him with the national movement. He never been part of the PLO. 
He never been part of the national movement. He was a bureaucrat at the World Bank. He was not part of the PLO. Uh, the Americans wanted him to be elected as a member of the Central Committee, but Fatah actually refused with their uh, sixth Congress, 2009, because he had no record of being the fighter. And the main source of legitimacy for the Palestinian national movement and the liberation movement is to be part of the revolution and the liberation movement, and he was not. He was not jailed. He was not part of the revolution, so he's not, he, he, he does not belong to this uh, revolutionary resistance uh, mentality of, of uh, the Palestinian national uh, liberation. I will move to the Hamas rule in Gaza after June 2007. I think in six months, they succeeded to sustain uh, and to control governance functions in Gaza, including security, economics, welfare, and public infrastructure. The first decision by the West Bank government of the Prime Minister uh, Salam Fayyad to order the 70,000 Palestinian Authority employees in Gaza to stay away from work, uh, or they will lose their salaries. So the Palestinian Authority continue to pay the salaries of all the Gazan who are employed by the Palestinian Authority. And the Hamas created a parallel bureaucratic system with 30,000 employees affiliated with Hamas. And it was actually a relief for Haniyeh and the, and the Hamas government to take this burden of 70,000 employees directly paid, paid by, by Ramallah. And this is still the case until today. The, uh, the Haniya Hamas government, they inherited an entire administrative apparatus uh, complete with a host of managerial and technical skills and procedures and mechanisms along with uh, regular regularity and all the legislative frameworks as developed by the Fatah dominated Palestinian Authority since 93. So it was ready for him to take over. And he have other advantages that the Ramallah-based Palestinian Authority don't enjoy at all. The unbroken territorial control over the, in the Gaza Strip had allowed Haniya government a degree of policy, coherent, and continuity. First thing that he did is to impose law and order and to end the chaos. The security chaos resulted from different families loyal to different fractions uh, shifting their loyalty one day Fatah under the Hamas and the third day uh, part of Al-Qaeda. And this was the case among some of the families in Gaza and it was a kind of unemployment uh, uh, opportunity for many of these family affiliated uh, guerrillas uh, to carry weapons and to get uh, support and budgets by the different fractions. Uh, according to an estimate by a local bankers the tunnel, Tunnels Authority of Hamas, they earned 150 to $200 million in 2009. We're talking about 5,000 tunnels to smuggle products from Egypt to Gaza. This is the main basic economy of the Hamas government beside their welfare system. Even they managed to establish a newly formed Islamic Bank, which is not recognized by the Central Bank of the Palestinian Authority. They established an insurance uh, company uh, and all the revenues as uh, used to, as part of their, their, their annual budget. So in terms of how sustainable their political regime, achieving their uh, law and order, and creating a coherent uh, one command of the military I think it is very stable. And the siege on Gaza worked for the benefit of Hamas. Uh, and even the boycott of the Hamas government and the Hamas elected uh, government was mainly directed against Fatah. The 70,000 employees were not receiving their salaries. And they are all Fatah affiliated. And it, it didn't affect Hamas. So the whole policy of international boycott against Hamas, it worked for the benefit of Hamas, and it worked against the Palestinian Authority. You know, 
there is a changing the rules of the Arab-Israeli conflict with the Salam Fayyad new strategy. You know, the classical strategy of any national movement ending the occupation first and then we start engaging in building our national institutions and our state. You know, when, when Arafat was asked about this, he was saying very simple slogan, Gaza will be Singapore after ending the occupation. It never worked out. Salam Fayyad came with a different approach, that we should not wait for the peace deal with Israel. We should build our state and to establish the foundations and the infrastructure for a Palestinian state before uh, ending the occupation and we will be ready to declare a state and to engage uh, in, 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 a, in what he called a viable uh, Palestinian state. The Palestinian government, the 13th government of the Palestinian Authority, in, uh, uh, they adopted a plan. Uh, this plan is talking about an ultimate goal by August 2011 to accomplish the institutional building of the Palestinian future state. In many occasions, Salam Fayyad refused uh, to talk about the issue of a unilateral declaration of state. He was giving a very simple answer. We are dealing with state building, not with state declaration. So he avoided this issue. And even in some cases, he referred to the presidency as the top uh, uh, level dealing with negotiations. And he is the man dealing with the daily functions and providing services. Salam Fayyad, as a bureaucrat, as the uh, a finance minister under Arafat from 2002 to 2005, didn't have any political, uh, he was not a politician, by the way. He was talking of himself as a bureaucrat, introducing reform, integrity, transparency within the Ministry of Interior, uh, Ministry of Finance. And he achieved that. But in the last two years, this man totally shifted his strategy, and he started to talk about him being a top leader, introducing a charismatic leadership character by moving all around the West Bank in 2009, he managed to, uh, to, to integrate a thousand projects, even in the, in the most remote villages in the West Bank. And this image of bureaucrat is not anymore a bureaucrat. He is sharing food with the ordinary people, sitting on the floor, eating by hand, dancing dabka, the, uh, the national dance, uh, collecting, you know, the olive uh, 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 and even a uh, going to the most simple uh, house in the occupied territories. So the guy understood that there is a gap here. Fatah in 2009 with the Sixth Congress, maybe faces are reallocated themselves, but it's the same old Oslo corrupt elite. Maybe they are younger, but they are all part of the Oslo old elite. All those who were elected as members of the Central Committee of Fatah, they belong to this elite, which is uh, still part of the economic uh, uh, monopoly. It's part of the uh, corruption uh, system, maybe less now, uh, because under Arafat it was a totally new patrimonial system. Now I think under Abu Mazen it is a semi new patrimonial system. It's still there. It's still a strong element of the, of the uh, political regime. West Bank economy is expected to grow 5% annually, and to, this was the case in 2009. Uh, since 2008, the World Bank, uh, they talk about 6,000 new jobs have been uh, created in the West Bank. Trade with Israel is up to, uh, 82%, tourism in Bethlehem is up 94%, and agricultural ex exports are up to 200%. So there is even this uh, argument used by uh, some 
foreign diplomats, we have to show the Hamas that things can work better in the West Bank, and they will be punished by the international community not providing assistance and donations and providing, you know, an annual uh, 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 financial assistance for, for, the, uh, for the budget of the PA, but it didn't affect them. I mean, they created their own economic place, as I talked before. And uh, the Salam Fayyad strategy still have a major weakness. But he's not coming from the national movement. He does not enjoy any national legitimacy. So he needs to make up such a thing. So he's now an active politician in all these campaigns against settlement products. He participate in, uh, uh, you know, uh, boycotting, uh, calling, uh, he called for uh, a boycott of goods imported from the uh, Israeli settlements. He even uh, participate uh, in this campaign from shop to shop to make sure that they don't have a settlement products. And by the way, the UK were labeling all these settlement products three years ago. But the PA started to adopt this policy recently. The, the, the issue of lack of strategy, if we will uh, gamble on a peace process and there's no uh, l progress, so what will be the alternative? Within the sixth Congress of the Fatah, there was two extremes. One, talking about the, uh, the uh, armed resistance, back to the old strategy of the Fatah, the PLO, and the Fatah mainly, and the other extreme will still want to be engaged even in a new interim agreement because there's still a hope for a comprehensive permanent agreement. But in between, we hear more and more voices, and it's adopted by Salam Fayyad talking about what they uh, consider a popular resistance. The first intifada model of a protest, pro protest against Israel in a non-violence campaign boycotting their products, having a peaceful demonstrations against the wall. The Na'lin Bilain, which is two villages north of Ramallah, they provided a successful model where Israel, because of the weekly, uh, uh, this is not because of these weekly uh, demonstrations, but Israel changed the route of the wall in, around these two villages. And this was considered by many Palestinian uh, field activists and by politicians as a successful and inspiring model for a peaceful resistance. So now they're talking about a new strategy. It's not uh, if the peace process will fail, we'll be able to resist the Israeli occupation by peaceful means and ending the Israeli occupation, similar to the way the first intifada brought the Madrid Peace Conference in 2001. The Palestinian cause was upgraded and was considered as a top priority by the international community in 2001 by addressing the resolution of the conflict and we have to get back to the same level and the international community should put pressure on Israel to end this occupation. So this is the dominant uh, you know, uh, uh, discourse among uh, the Palestinian leaders in the West Bank. Gaza, they are in between delivering messages which could potentially accept them by the international community, like Israel is a fact. We accept Israel. We are willing to recognize Israel if we'll be part of the international legitimacy, if we'll be part of the game. And the others will use the old argument of resistance and the record of Hamas fighting the Israeli, uh, Israelis and not only the Israeli occupation, but you know, uh, the, their attacks against the Israeli civilians in Israel proper. So I think I was trying to draw a kind of topology of the uh, conflict far from the position and the statements of politicians about the just cause and the Palestinian national demand and the Palestinian national right and the right for self-determination. Because I think there's more, even more dominant factors, trends affecting the whole spectrum of the Palestinian people, whether Hamas or Fatah internally, and they will be part of the whole package. So what is the expected uh, scenarios? I think there's three scenarios. 
Uh, and I think based on this lecture, and we can talk about it later uh, through uh, asking questions, these three scenarios are uh, a way things will develop based on the current trends and, and, and factors. The first scenario, I gave it a name, two heads of the political system. We have the Gaza, Hamas continued to rule Gaza, the national unity dialogue failed, Israel eased its siege around Gaza, this is the today talks, you can identify some of these elements and, and current trends even today, which is happening already today. The tunnel economy continued to be the main economic base of the Hamas government. Uh, what is certain is that the new economy enabled Hamas to look after its own with the, with the 32,000 government employees, another 40,000 to 50,000 people working in or around the Hamas regulated tunnel economy and a network of Hamas associated Islamic charities and Zakat committee complementing the social welfare uh, that the movement can rely on uh, to sustain its government, uh, its ruling uh, uh, governance in, in, in Gaza. There's a new political reality now in Gaza. There's a successful governance of Gaza. Maybe some people will argue that Palestinian public opinion are against Hamas, less supporting Hamas, uh, I don't think this is the main factor. The main factor is their ability to control security and to provide services and to provide the basic welfare system and to respond to the needs of the people. Uh, the expectations that the siege and the international boycott of Hamas government will force it to surrender is no more realistic. And we all know that. International solidarity groups and campaigns to lift the siege, it actually opened doors to the external world for Gaza. You see, we, we can even today, can see many parliamentarians, not only from the Arab Muslim countries, but from Europe, meeting their top leaders and talking about the need to lift the siege uh, 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 Gaza. This is, I consider this the beginning of the de facto recognition of Hamas. West Bank, Fayyad is going to achieve his development goals without ending the occupation. But he is prepared and he put the infrastructure and the foundation for declaring a state, which I don't think the Palestinians will declare it in a unilateral action. Because the whole, I mean, one, Israel will use this to annex land, because they are still dominating and controlling the territories, 60% of the land in the West Bank, and all settlement blocks were de facto annexed by building the 760 kilometers of wall around the West Bank, he managed to impose law and order in the West Bank. The whole security case resulted from this uh, street guerrillas of the Second Intifada is ended. And all these activists, their top leaders were guaranteed positions within the, the new system of the PA, and this is the way to integrate them. Uh, Nablus and Gaza and, and uh, Sorry, Nablus and Jenin in the north were the, were the most harsh uh, cases for the uh, challenging the Palestinian security and the chaos. I think they resolved this issue, uh, and many of these activists, they are part of the bureaucracy, not the security, but the, the bureaucracy. Peace talks failed to reach a permanent, I'm still in the scenario one, the peace talks failed to reach a permanent comprehensive agreement, an interim agreement or arrangement, like giving the Palestinian Authority more responsibility on, in, in a new uh, urban centers. Uh, this could happen, and Israelis start to talk about giving the Palestinian Authority more responsibilities in Area B, which is the Palestinian civilian uh, control uh, of the, uh, and the Israeli security control. Fayyad continue to enjoy the confidence and the support of the Fatah. And the second scenario is the total collapse. The failure of the peace process, Abbas will step down after losing his legitimacy because he was the man of peace. 
He considered this as the only strategy. Fatah declared that the peace process failed to achieve a national liberation and expressed the need to go back to a combined strategy of a popular and armed res resistance, struggle against the Israeli occupation. The old Oslo elite and the internal Fatah leadership, what I mean by internal is those leaders uh, uh, within the West Bank, uh, they dismissed Fayyad and all his new elite that they supported the development strategy before ending the occupation. So this strategy and the plan to build a state, it failed to achieve the national liberation goals. The collapse of the economic and traditional elite in the West Bank, which is sharing the, the benefits of the top level elite, uh, you know, they are, they are totally dependent on the political elite the non-functional Palestinian Authority institutions are on the verge of collapse. The international community reduced its support to the Palestinian Authority because of the failure of the peace process. Fatah elements declared that the PA as a legal and administrative entity does not exist anymore and all Palestinians are under a direct Israeli occupation. Hamas declared that the defeated Fatah strategy of peace it is actually supporting the argument of resistant strategy and they express the will to take over to save the Palestinian people from a lack of strategy and to proceed with the struggle against the Israeli occupation. So this is actually taking over and, uh, uh, and some of their top leaders, by the way, they will talk about it in a very open, frank way that the, P, the Fatah was actually replacing the, the, the pan-Arab uh, strategy and uh, turning the Palestinian issue into a Palestinian patriot, you know, the Palestinian national issue rather than a Arab, uh, national Arab issue, uh, knowing that the PLO was established by Egypt, not by the Palestinians. They, they took over uh, in, 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 90, uh, in, in 1986, uh, 68, and it's about time that we will take over, that you failed as a national liberation movement. We have a better strategy, and we can introduce this strategy to the Palestinian people, and we can represent these Palestinian people. They are talking about this in an open way. Hamas is <coughs> dominated by the jihadi uh, militia groups. This new reality uh, causes unrest for the entire region and led to a regional war with a semi-formal military organization groups from Lebanon, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Iran. Talk about a confrontation between Israel and Arab uh, organizations. Scenario three, this is the optimal scenario. That it can, and, I, and this is what I call the viable democratic Palestine. That the forces in Hamas that believe in political participation and melding Hamas into the Palestinian political life, they prevail. The international community recognizes Hamas as long as it remains willing to participate with the national forces in maintaining calm and security and politi political stability for the sake of resuming the peace process. The national and Islamic forces reach uh, a national consensus consensus that determinate that the Palestinian priorities and agenda based uh, on the top level national interest and addressing issues of reform, fighting corruption, uh, ending the security chaos, integrating Hamas within the security uh, forces. This was the failure of the Mecca Accord that you know, security continued to be under presidency and Hamas established a parallel security force uh, in Gaza and they, 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 they took over the, the security force of the Fatah. Uh, the, the, the Hamas agreed, they agree on a political program based on serving the national, the Palestinian national interest and accepting the establishing of a Palestinian state within June 4, 1967 borders. They also ag agree that a viable democratic Palestinian state 
is the only guarantee for Palestine and the future of the Palestinian people. They are talking about uh, donor countries under this scenario, donor countries whom support 90% of the annual budget of the Palestinian Authority today. They will take a new approach in dealing with the issue of support of the Palestinian Authority by concentrating on supporting the private sector and the civil society in, additional, in addition to supporting the government. The economic situation witnessed, you know, uh, uh, a you know, uh, improving the economic situation, GDP per capita income increase significantly. We're talking about a renewed hope for political and economic horizon. The, the Arab and Islamic and international investment in Palestine, Palestinian state uh, witness uh, intensive return of Palestinian capital and know-how to take part in the building of the Palestinians. This is the naive scenario, but you know, let me dream about it. This is talking about uh, the, uh, the uh, viable democratic Palestine. I think this scenario could work under two options. One is a comprehensive permanent status agreement to a, uh, an interim agreement which will last for a long period. So under these two options, this viable democratic state, using the Salam Fayyad plan and his parallel strategy of building a viable state parallel to ending the occupation, I think is the right strategy. I want to stop here to allow you to ask questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes, so could I please ask you uh, to identify yourself and your organization before you ask your question? Rajan. Thank uh, VK Rajan, Chester Transantec International, Singapore. Dr. Rami, thank you very much for your presentation today. I'm not so sure whether you are more optimistic now, today, than you were here before, about a year ago, where all these peace talks is going to end. Now, putting that aside, Obama and Netanyahu, I just saw one hour ago some TV clip. Very good in form, nothing much in substance. He even walked Netanyahu to the car. I was told that's the first time he has done it. But when the question was asked, how about uh, us of Obama, how about, uh, did the Netanyahu you tell you that he's going to freeze the construction settlements? Obama's reply was, he waited it and said, well, if they begin to talk, things will fall into place. Okay, <clears throat> now, I have watched for the last few decades quite a bit good interest the seesaw of these peace talks. It's like chasing a little bit like the rainbow here, you see. It's close, but always he moves. Uh, Israel, I don't know for what reason, it is so powerful, but when, only when you're powerful you can have a good lasting settlement. No country in history, at least to my little knowledge, has survived oppressing people in an occupied country, degrading them for very long. Okay. Having said that, but Arabs don't need enemies. They have many of themselves. In fact, when Palestine was formed, uh, or Israel was formed, all the Arab countries hate the Palestinians to fight on, not to settle. Since then, <laughs> they are doing the same thing. Uh, I watched Arab League, 22 countries. Someone cynically said, they hug each other, kiss each other on the uh, cheeks every time. Somebody said if they do that, that means the more they do that, the more they distrust themselves. But Palestinians themselves have done quite a bit of dividing themselves. Uh, I won't go into the detail. Now, where is this going to lead? Does anybody really want peace? If all of them had wanted peace very seriously, it would have been settled. How many years? 30, 40 years? Who really wanted peace? I have known from little uh, dealings with the Palestinians. They are very, very capable people. 
Maybe some of the Arab countries are scared. Palestine becomes a whole democratic country which is a city in peace. They may overtake many of them. Thank you. You know, first you have to define peace. What is the vision of peace for both sides? If you'll ask a Palestinian today about his vision of peace, he'll tell you a very simple answer. Just leave me alone. I'm not interested. No one is talking about the macro politics. They're talking about the survival techniques. Even in, 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 in the most uh, you know, flourishing city like Ramallah, people lost confidence and hope with the peace process. When you ask Israeli about the, what they mean by peace is to keep the peace by peace under their control. <laughs> and uh, using the argument that demography and security threat, they are the considerations to keep the domination of Israel. I think this is a short-term objective, and this is very military philosophy and approach, not considering the potential of a better future for everyone. So we are still stuck with the past. With the past. We are still talking about how to minimize the risk and not how to enlarge the potential for a better future for the two nations. In our side, we have also a problem that we still insist on our national demand. Why? Because it's a just cause. Because everyone should be supportive of the Palestinian national right. I think this is passe. This is no long uh, a strategy that we should rely on. We should combine the strategy of empowering ourselves as a nation. What happened in the last 43 years of the Israeli occupation that we lost our educated class, our middle class, our economic class. They are everywhere in Europe, in the United States, but not in Palestine. We ended with the people who have no hope, or people who are stupid, like myself, who still stuck there. No, I mean, this is the reality. I mean, if you even, I mean, all the, the, the my generation uh, studying at the school, none of them really uh, live or continue to live in Jerusalem anymore. People moved somewhere else, uh, to the Arab countries, to Dubai, to, to even to Amman. It became the metropolitan center of the West Bank, not Ramallah. Ramallah is just a small administrative uh, center for the Palestinian Authority. So we're still stuck with the, with the past. We are still refusing to consider the future and the potential for future. So no one is talking about this future approach, uh, this future potential of peace. They are talking about how to minimize the risk, how to keep uh, this risk under the minimum level. And this will not lead us anywhere, both sides. Please. Dr. Nasrallah, my name is uh, Burhanuddin. I'm a retiree, <coughs> just an interested uh, observer of the Palestinian diaspora. My view is that the Palestinian question has been hanging over us from the time, because I've been following this trend about Palestinian uh, nationhood from the time of uh, the hijacking of the aircrafts by Leila Khalid and the, uh, you know, the extremist elements of uh, George Habas and Naif Hawatman. So I was wondering, wherein lies the Palestinian uh, diaspora? Because uh, may I ask a question before I continue? I believe Palestine has thrown up more doctorates. PhDs than anywhere else in the world. Am I correct? No, no, no. Only in the Arab world. Maybe Lebanon is first and Palestine is the second, but not anymore. Education is deteriorating. Yeah, no. down. Yes. Oh, because uh, I remember a lecture by Dr. Edward Said, who is now deceased. Um, he mentioned that 57% of the PhDs around the world are Palestinians. So education actually is the crux of the thing. Now that the occupation forces of the Zionists have denied the Palestinians 
the right to educate yourself in a institution. Have, has the current uh, regime of Abu Mazem as well as uh, Ismail Haniya, have they factored in the education process for the Palestinian people? This is my question to you. Thank you. I, I think I should refer to the pre-Oslo and the pre-Palestinian Authority period. The Palestinians in the occupied territories, I'm talking about the West Bank and Gaza, they, they believed in the strategy of Salam Fayyad long time ago. The first thing that they did was to establish universities, education uh, center, uh, educational uh, centers and, and cultural centers, media groups, and they were considering this as an alternative for the Israeli occupation institutions. No Palestinian wanted to deal with the Israeli occupation institutions. And actually, Israel didn't uh, object to this because they wanted to talk with the local leadership. So they allow this civil society base to be emerged in the occupied territories because they wanted to talk with a local leadership. And this was the case in 2001 with the Madrid peace talks that the Palestinian delegation was mainly locals from East Jerusalem and the West Bank and Gaza. Heather Abdel Shafi was the head of the Palestinian delegation. And they were all uh, Palestinians uh, from the West Bank and Gaza, affiliated with the PLO, but not formally a members of the PLO. This was a precondition by Israel. But the Oslo peace process actually ended the Palestinian historical role of this leadership and the civil society, because they are talking now with the PLO of Tunis, not with nationalists in the West Bank. First thing Arafat did when he returned back was to marginalize this leadership and to shut down all civil society organizations who consider these institutions as a competing political power. Today, the, civil, the remaining civil society organizations, they are supportive of Salam Fayyad strategy, and they were even talking about this was the strategy in, that we adopted long time ago, even in 1987. The first document established about the Palestinian interim regime was um, formulated by Sari Nusayba and Faisal Husseini and Hanan Ashrawi and the uh, 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 Hedar Abdel Shafi in the 1988-89. Uh, so it, it's have a rooted history, you know. But the new culture, the new ruling culture of a dominant security forces, a top leader who is a neo-patrimonial personal loyalty is the name of the game. This is a classical Arab regime that we Palestinians in Jerusalem and the, in, and the West Bank and Gaza, we were not aware of at all. And we were shocked that we fight it for democratic values and all the students' commit, uh, committees, student unions, uh, professional unions, uh, the uh, trade unions were elected in a democratic uh, way uh, pre-Oslo. Now it's appointed by a military guy, by Mukhabarat, by a secu security service guy. In the universities, things went, you know, in the wrong way. We see more and more domination of security people, just writing reports. Who's Hamas? Who's Fatah? Who's Mukhabarat? Who's preventive security? And it's easy to get, to, you know, to, to pass an exam because you are a security guy. <laughs> this is the case. Nothing in a, we, we stop talking about quality of education. We have many universities, we have many graduates. But the, the level of education deteriorated, both in Gaza and the West Bank. Even the top best universities, like Birzeit University or Al Najah University, they are suffering from this. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. I'll come to you, uh, Ambassador. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, I'm Diane Jayatilaka with the Institute of South Asian Studies. Uh, like the previous speaker, I too sort of grew up with, with uh, Karame through uh, you know, right down to Jenin, if you like, in terms of battles. 
familiar with the critique that Hanan Nashravi and Edward Said made of the Oslo deviation, as it were. A uh, couple of questions uh, clustered together. One, uh, could you update us on the uh, Marwan Baguti initiative uh, from within the prisons where Hamas and Fatah prisoners uh, called for unity? Uh, has that any shelf life or has it been exhausted? What is the status of Baguti as a figure and so on? Uh, the second question is that uh, I have come across a new idea. Uh, people like Professor Richard Falk and others have put it forward that Israel has begun to lose the global legitimacy war. Uh, while on the other side, the two state solution is looking demographically uh, dead. And therefore, is there a possibility for renewal of the old project of a, uh, a binational? secular state or a new sort of transformation is, is, is a new slogan, a new project possible and necessary? This is the second question. Um, and uh, the third and final question is about uh, black swan events or outlier events. How would a possible potential clash between Israel and Iran, an Israeli attack really on Iran, uh, affect the dynamics of uh, of the whole Israeli-Palestinian equation. Uh, given also the changes that have taken place within Israeli society and Israeli politics, a new configuration that we see is far more ideologically rigid than anything that we have seen before. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I will start with the first question. I think Marwan uh, one, was one of the marginalized leader, leaders by Arafat should not forget this. Uh, there's two opinions about Marwan Barghouti from an Israeli perspective. One, that he is the Palestinian Mandela, and we should release him. This is the Shabak opinion at that time, the Israeli security uh, uh, secret, uh, forces, uh, you know, the secret uh, service. And the army is totally against this, the Israeli army. On the Palestinian side, Marwan is popular more in the region of Ramallah, maybe Nablus. But Palestine, because of the fragmentation, because of the 650 road blockades since 2000, Second Intifada, because of the 760 kilometers of a barrier and a wall, it became a very localized society. Even the notion of nationalism and national interest is even more weak today. So leaders on, in their region, they are popular, but I don't think with the, with the sympathy that everyone had have to Marwan, he can be the Palestinian Mandela or can be the top leader unless he will join forces with others. And the Fatah is built all around coalitions, but each time we talk about coalition, you will get the old Oslo elite, corrupt elite, as a dominant factor. Even around Salam Fayyad, by the way. They're still the dominant power, because they are recognized by the international community. They were uh, supposed to deliver, they never did, but they're still considered as a trusted elite. You know. The problem of the Palestinian national movement, even when, when the PLO was in Beirut, that many Arab and regional forces were in, have a lot of say within the decision making of the Palestinian, of, uh, Palestinian national movement. This is still the case. I think Egypt have had its own agenda, Jordan, they want to eliminate the Muslim Brotherhood and to disengage Hamas from the Islamic Brotherhood in Jordan, which is, you know, we know that they, they are one, one body, you know, Hamas, West Bank, and Jordan, they're one body. They try to, uh, to disengage between them. Syria have a different package of interest, the same with Iran, the same with Israel, the CIA, the MI5, whatever. It's a conflicting interest. It does not give the Palestinians the space to shape and reshape their agenda and their priorities. 
So Marwan is one of the names that they mention about in all, in all the time, but we have other great leaders like, uh, I don't know if you heard this name, uh, the uh, Muhammad Ghnaim. He was one of the top leaders in Tunis. He was the head of the Fatah. But he was against Oslo. He never returned back. He returned back a year ago. No one hear of him anymore. Because Fatah lost credibility. And the majority of the Palestinian people today want to step away from Fatah Hamas fight and, and, and to look for something new. We are reluctant. We can't look for something new because we didn't achieve our national goals. This era of national liberation is, is still on hold. We can't move to a national building, to a state building, to a civil culture, a democratic culture, while we are stuck with our nationalism and national liberation. So this is the dilemma of the Palestinian people. And we have the paradox that leaders will talk about peace. But if they want to gain popularity and legitimacy, they will talk about you know, fighting the occupation. And this will sound like an anti-Israel, which is not. I mean, even by cutting the settlement who occupy our land, grabbing our land daily, it's became anti-Israel for many Israelis today, which is not. I mean, uh, it's clear message that not to buy, boycott Israel products, is to boycott settlement products. So it is not easy for the Palestinians. It's not easy for the Israelis. Talking about the two-state solution, I think the wall is ending, and it's already ended, this theoretical idea of one-state solution, democratic state of solution. And the segregation even inside Israel is much larger and much even between Jewish and Palestinian Israelis. With the wall, I think this idea is not any more realistic. The two-state solution is still the only option. It can't be uh, a partial solution of giving part of the land. It can't be uh, uh, a, you know, a, a security plan keeping 60% of the West Bank and fragmenting the Palestinian territories and controlling the borders and the Jordan Valley. It can't be. It should be a viable, democratic, contiguous state. Israelis should take the risk. And believe me, if Palestine will be a viable democratic state, this is the best service for Israel. Because Israel will be integrated in the Middle East, it will be part of the Middle East, it will not be a small island within the enemy uh, surrounding. And the only condition to achieve that is to have peace with the Palestinians. It's not Iran, by the way. I mean, Palestine, you know, Israelis, they, 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 they underestimate our you know, threat, you know, they consider us as a non-strategic threat because they can deal with us. They can hit and get back. They can deal with Gaza as a, what they call a, a, a green, a green uh, house of terror. And they can hit any time. Their technology can reach anyone. But the threat is there because we should be able to live next to each other. I mean, I have many Israeli friends and I wanted to know more about their cognitive map. And I kept asking many of my friends whether they recognize the wall driving or road number six, which is the main you know, national road uh, but, you know, close to the West Bank. And they never recognized the wall in Kalkilia and Tulkarim, which is just 12 kilometers from the coastal area, from Tel Aviv, because it's there. It's the third world country. And Israel is actually moving to a different scale of, of a Western uh, globalized economy uh, with its economic uh, global elite in Tel Aviv. And these people intend not to think about the conflict. They want to forget about the conflict. They want to avoid talking about the conflict. And we have the ideologists, the national religious, in Jerusalem, around Jerusalem, in the West Bank. And I think this is different Israel. This is not a one discourse. And we have a problem facing with which Israel we are talking to. Is it the global civil Israel or it's the ideological Israel? How to bridge between these? The, the, there is a gap here. 
similar to the gap that we have between West Bankers and the Gazan who are, who are part of the package and the Palestinian diaspora, that they should be part of the comprehensive deal. We can't keep away six million or seven million by now refugees uh, out of this uh, comprehensive uh, solution. It should be a comprehensive deal not to end the Israeli occupation in the 67 borders, but it should be a conciliation between the Palestinians and Israel, the Arabs, Muslims, based on the Saudi initiative, which was totally neglected by the Israeli leadership, Sharon, and, and, and it's almost not there. It's, it's just irrelevant. So Iran, good for publicity, for uh, showing uh, the uh, strategic threat for Israel. I don't underestimate this uh, threat, but they, it should not be used to underline, uh, to undermine the Palestinian cause and, not to, and to avoid dealing with the Palestinian issue, which is the core issue for the two nations. Yes, please. Uh, Lim King <coughs> from Singapore. Um, I think history provided us a lot of relevant experience. I think Palestinians, if they want to seek international recognition, it has to have power by itself. 1804, uh, Foreign Secretary Harrowby tell uh, Sec uh, Secretary of State medicines. If you do not have power, then don't fly your flag. The British tell the Americans. The same thing, uh, 12th of March, 1937. Uh, Churchill tell the world that you do not have the right, neither do you have the power on Palestinian issues. So it is important for the Palestinians to unite among yourself and to bring good governance to your people. Otherwise, international recognition as given to Pinochet, Nong No, Park Chong Hee, Suhato did not last. I think it is important for you to recognize yourself, to improve your educations of your people, so that you can have your own people to lead your own institutions, just like Middle East Institute. Singaporeans need to learn from the history just like Palestinians have to. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I don't know how to answer you, but I think Oslo, uh, which is a great concept, but it's a horrible implementation, it was focusing mainly on security uh, issues, how to provide security, and without tackling the, 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 the real issues. You know that the Palestinian GDP per capita under Oslo, the good days of Oslo, dropped down from 4,000 under the Israeli occupation to 1,200 and to 900 and maybe now it's $1,000. Less in Gaza, $700. So it didn't achieve prosperity. Peace is a way of life. It didn't brought security to the Israelis. But the focus on security as a goal, not, not as a tool, this was one of the biggest mistakes of the, of the Oslo peace process. And we should learn from that. Power is, we don't want to be a, a military power. I think Palestine should invest all its, I mean, it's, it, we have only one thing, human capital. And we should invest this in building a strong state, strong education system, strong health system, cultural life, urbanization, and this is the, the way, and we have to be part of the region and part of the global economy of the region, and I think we are capable to do it. And this is our power. Our power is our human resources. We tried all the power games of resistance, military resistance, terror, name it. It all failed. On the Israeli side, Someone like me, who was educated at the Hebrew University of Israel, when I start talking about our right for a viable democratic state, they start to laugh. I said, you, third world country, are you capable to do it? Do you, are you deserve it? We have to shift 
the discourse from dealing with the Palestinian issue as a humanitarian issue, as a third world country problem, and Israel, if will not promote a partnership, a real partnership with the Palestinians, to remove at least the obstacles of creating a viable democratic Palestinian state, functionally, geographically, I think they are going to lose on the long term, and this is against the Israeli interest. I'm not here to reflect only my Palestinian package and agenda and priorities. I don't want you to support my national rights. This is not important anymore. But I want you to support the building of my nation and my state and my viability. And this is a responsibility of Israel, of the international community, and we should be the one who will achieve that and the one who should remove all obstacles, mainly Israel. 6,000 Palestinian holders of foreign passports are not allowed to access Palestine because Israel is controlling the borders. They issue the visas. These people were contributing a lot to our economy, to our education, to our medical services, mainly European and American citizens. citizens. The, the, the way Israel deal with them as potential terrorists. Why your name is an Arab name. I have this feeling going through Bengalian airport all the time. I have to be checked as an object, not as a human being. I'm fluent in Hebrew. I'm traveling three, four times a month, but still I'm an object. They have to check me as an object. This is, will, this will not lead us anywhere. We have to push them to change, and we have to change ourselves. It's not a one unilateral uh, demand. I'm uh, Eric Wong um, from SP Joshua uh, Employee Benefits Company. Sorry. This. Uh, all these problems in the Middle East obviously uh, is affecting everyone else in the world and uh, <coughs> does not add to security at all. And <coughs> Can you speak up? What, I can't yes. You. Sorry. So uh, the uh, problems in, in uh, the Middle East and particularly in Palestine uh, affecting the rest of the world and uh, decreasing uh, level of security for all, uh, even in Singapore. Um, what is the underlying uh, problem here? Could it be that uh, a and uh, attitude of victim, uh, victimhood? Uh, is this uh, uh, blinding you know, the visions of a powerful country? And uh, feeling that oneself is a victim and uh, therefore taking extreme measures and uh, which don't really solve the problem. And this goes on and on. And are different parties in the Middle East, are they all uh, 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 so burdened by this sense of victimhood because of history? You know, uh, they suffer, each, each nation suffered greatly at different times of uh, history. And, and so therefore, uh, they fall back to extreme measures. Uh, each in turn. Uh, is this the core problem? And, and all the attempts, all the great efforts at uh, suppression and so on are not uh, leading anyone anywhere. And yet time is ticking away. As the demography changes over time, is there a point where a point be reached, a point of no return, where the two-state solution will no longer be possible? Is there such a, such a risk? Or can the two-state solution come at its own time mm -hmm. with the uh, different birth rates going on and with the intermingling? And uh, can Israel uh, remain a democracy? Um, that's my question. You know, I can't answer for the Israelis, as you know. Uh, but uh, 
I think the, uh, the two-state solution is still there. And we have to move fast, at least to have the political horizon for such a solution. And to remove all obstacles related to the risk of today by keeping territory, Jordan Valley and the, you know, the, uh, the border between uh, the West Bank and, 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 uh, and Jordan, and to look for more creative uh, solutions for security. Security threat is not any more related to Israel, it's more related to the region with global jihad and with all the security threat around. Even Hamas recognized this threat by getting to a mosque and killing a top leader of Al-Qaeda because they recognize this could threat their stability as a political regime. So security threat is not any more uh, a monopoly of Israel. I think Jordan facing a lot of security troubles. It could potentially, you know, create instability. Uh, I think there should be a situation where the Palestinian issue will not be labeled to delegitimize uh, the efforts of getting to a, a peace process. Sometimes the Palestinian issue has been used as a, a, a label uh, not to integrate uh, Muslim communities in Europe. They just go against their governments uh, using the, the Palestinian issue, the, the solidarity with the Palestinians. So there is still a domestic politics uh, under this package of supporting the Palestinian um, cause everywhere, by the way. Uh, here in this Southeast Asia, uh, that have their own domestic uh, politics in Europe everywhere. The two-state solution is the only solution uh, because we don't want to live uh, mixing with each other. We want to live next to each other. And there's no successful model of integration. Israel is a Jewish state. It will continue to be a Jewish state. And the Israeli self-determination is by having a state with the defined borders. And this is what Israel should accept to define its final borders. Palestinians deserve a state because we waited for this for a long, long, long time. It's still there. I don't want to use the one-state solution the way some of my top leaders using this to threaten the Israelis by telling them, look, if you don't accept the two-state solution, one-state solution will be the, 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 the only option. It's not. Because we don't want to mix, because we are a fragmented society, because we are uh, you know, having a huge socio-economic, socio-cultural gap between the two groups. We are two nations. We are two, two national inspirations. This is, this is reality. And we have the physical wall that I hope that one day it will be dismantled because, I mean, with, 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 with a drive of less than an hour from Tel Aviv to the Jordan Valley, there's no logic of having these walls preventing the two nations from integrating with, you know, interacting with each other and building a better future for the whole region. This is maybe the utopian, uh, but one day uh, it will be a reality. Maybe not my generation, but we have no other choice. Um, sorry, uh, when I talk about power, it's not talking about offensive power, but power among yourself, uh, ability to defend yourself, ability to educate your people, ability to interact with others without being treated as a subject, like what you mentioned. You know, the Jews experience worse uh, isolations than Palestinians. I think you agree with that. But they eventually come out as a nation. I think we have to learn from that that power is not necessarily offensive. Without power, you cannot survive. You can't even lead your own institutions. I believe in limitation of power, so yes. I count on that. <laughs> yeah, so, thank you. Yes, please. My name is Arlie Smood, and I'm a student at uh, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. 
Um, my question also has to do with uh, the Palestinian's power and the, the way he defines it. Uh, I'm very pessimistic of peace coming without U.S. involvement, and I'm very pessimistic about the U.S. ever recognizing Hamas. So with that being said, do you see Hamas and Fatah ever reconciling? And if so, how could that be done? Mm-hmm. There's two levels here. Uh, I mean, having uh, a top leader who's part of the Oslo old elite, uh, like Jibril Joub, who was the, one of the heads of the preventive security in the West Bank, where Israel released his brother, who was the top leader of Hamas, this is uh, one family. And you have a similar situation among many Palestinian families where two brothers, three brothers, one Hamas, one Fatah, and it's uh, at the level of the social fabric, I don't think we have a problem. The problem is at the top level where the international, the regional and the international interest are preventing the national unity because they have their own interest and their own package of interest that to try to introduce and to impose on President Abbas, preventing him from being more uh, serious about national unity, preventing Hamas from engaging in a very serious national unity without you know, uh, knowing in advance what we will get. Because this is what is kept them busy. Uh, what, you know, they want to guarantee the outcomes before getting engaged in a process. And sometimes it's a replacement mentality rather than political partnership. At the end, the whole package of removing from national liberation to a civil, uh, I would say non-revolutionary, non-resistant, non-liberation, liberation but not by peaceful means, uh, this is a strong element which will dictate for the two parties when and how to engage in a national unity. And whether Hamas will be a part of the Palestinian uh, political uh, uh, map or not, uh, whether Hamas will be uh, uh, supportive of the uh, peace process or not, whether they will continue to sustain the security around Gaza despite all the talks. You know, believe me, you have Israelis will declare one thing, but at the end, at the ground level, I believe there is a lot of interaction between Israel and, and Hamas. No coordination at the border can take place without such a level. All their cabinet was jailed in Israel, so they must talk to them. Maybe, I don't know which level, but they, they already did. No, I mean, they, they already, you know, for a long, long, long time they have this dialogue, and they have the old, uh, you know, dialogue and, and promoting a competing power to, to Fatah and to the PLO. It's a matter of uh, how to reallocate the whole Palestinian political system, which new forces will emerge, whether this new uh, civil uh, constructive culture of a building institutions will succeed or not. Because I, I give you my personal experience. As a Palestinian who had never been to an Israeli jail, as you know, I was criticized all the time. How come you are an advisor to the prime minister? You've never been part of the resistant. You've never been part of the suffer. You enjoyed life going to the Hebrew University. So this was one of the, you know, the, the major criticism against someone like me. And there is an emerging uh, Palestinian, I will say, uh, uh, generation who are in the same position, never been to Israeli jail. They, uh, they get a good education. Uh, and I think they are not in a position to gain any power today in the current political system because it's still based on your legitimacy as a nationalist. But one day it will happen. I don't know when. And then it is all together. You know, it is all the combination of all the elements that I mentioned. They have to work all together. It's not Hamas vis-a-vis Fatah. You know, uh, 
many of the Palestinian students, they are not affiliated with any uh, political party, at least 40%, according to the, some public opinion polls. So this is the very politicized uh, uh, young people. They are not. They, are, they lost confidence with with with, pol with politics, with the Palestinian fractions, and they don't support Hamas, not Fatah. They're looking for something new. They are looking for, uh, you know, because these two political parties were educating their affiliated people. That first thing to do is is fighting the occupation, ending the occupation. Nothing about their inspiration, nothing about their future, nothing about, they don't exist as individuals. No one will respond to their agenda, to their, their youth agenda, to their, you know, hopes, to their, you know, dreams. It's not there, because, you know, it's, the whole thing was dominated by fighting the occupation, not by building a better society, a civil society, especially when the PA returned back to the Palestinian occupied territories. It was more pluralistic, it was more open, it was less, less religious, it was more uh, secular before than with, you know, the, when the conflict escalated, people became more conservative, more religious, more traditional. They tried to look at the traditional family affiliation to protect them because they have, they, they have no party uh, to, to protect them and to advance their agenda. Uh, I don't consider the national unity as an objective by itself is a tool to move ahead and to establish a better Palestinian political system which will take the lead in establishing uh, the what I call the best case scenario. Uh, on that very happy note, could you please... Oh, sorry. I thought was to ask this. Yes, you, you were going to ask a question? No. Ah. Oh, please, please, please. I'm sorry to um, no, 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 no. Please. come into the last minutes, but as a, a point can be made even in the last minutes, as we saw last night with the, that soccer uh, against Uruguay. Um, Rami, uh, thanks for the um, uh, explanations. Uh, my name is Atam Ramsundar Singh. I live in Singapore. I'm a Dutch citizen. I work with the World Bank. I was uh, involved on the Israeli side and on the Palestinian side for many years. Your last points, Rami, that you just tried to make, it's about the aspirations of those 40%, probably even the 100% of people living in West Bank and Gaza. What I experienced visiting Palestinian homes in refugee camps, Gaza, West Bank, I've been working with Israelis, ex-Air Force generals, ex-commanders, ambassadors, sometimes together with Rami, sometimes in secret. Um, what I learned, it's a deep-rooted human urge for peace and realization of their individual and family aspirations, both sides. International community is not focusing on that. We are locked in the box of classical scenarios two states, one state, yes, no, yes, no, zero, one, zero, one. It's not going to go anywhere. I accept that as a reality of today's minds. What is important is the discussion we had a few years ago uh, in Jerusalem of establishing people-to-people -people dialogues. Those people moved by their human urges for peace. When you ask a Palestinian mother, deep in Jabalia camp in Gaza. What do you want? She says, I want a good life. I don't want my son or my daughter to be killed. I need water. I need food. I need education. I need medical health care. When I had an interview with the Hamas, blindfolded, a couple of years ago for the Dutch government, I went into the Hamas circles and had a three-hour interview. After a parade of accusations to the West, I thought I look like an Indian, I might be killed even. Um, uh, but it, went, it, it became a tremendous interesting dialogue. When I asked the Hamas leader, people like Mahmoud Sahar, who is now uh, in exile, what do you need from the West, a country like the Netherlands? How can we help you? 
I got a long list of very constructive ideas. On that list was not mentioned weapons. These guys don't want that. What they want is substance and security for their people in terms of food, health, etc. So where am I going? What I want to say is that, is there a possibility, Rami, and you and I are in a sort of a permanent dialogue, I also want to continue it here. Um, is there a possibility to elevate knowing these human urges, knowing they exist, we have been in those families, even though the politicians have that. Can we elevate this dialogue to a level where we don't talk about a state, but we start the dialogue by connecting to people's aspirations, dreams. Can I marry with somebody from Gaza? How will my marriage will be organized? Logistic issues. Can we take it from that level to a level that becomes the, the foundations for whatever solutions that can be built? Trust building is important. We were involved in all these sort of confidential dialogues in Sweden. It all stopped. Why? Because the resources were lacking. I would say, if you can take this with your generation of people, that people like myself have helped educating as well, if you can take this level to a level where the dialogue can really result into actions by grassroots movements, not directly re related to all these political mafias, as I would call them, but to people with true um, intentions. Can then institutes like the Middle East Institute, with support of the Singapore government or other Asian governments, don't rely only on the Americans or on the Europeans. There are Europeans who could be uh, supportive. But can Asia push support financially, intellectually, technologically, take this support and help you people to enter into a dialogue with each other and another bridge to, the, to those Israelis who have the same human urge of safety, uh, building a future, etc., and, and nurture, feed the dialogue with positive thinking that we find here uh, in Asia with a lot of experiences in this part of the world. I think that's where the, the leadership could come in of a third force, but a force that encourages dialogue. What would you think about that, Rami? First, I do support the Dutch team. As you know, <laughs> I think, you know, even in Gaza, according to uh, the FAFO public opinion survey just published now, even in Gaza, 65% they still support the two-state solution and a comprehensive permanent agreement. 73% among Fatah supporters and 64% among Hamas supporters. So this is, this is the hope for me as a Palestinian. The same on the Israeli side. Two-thirds of the Israelis, they still do support the two-state solution. We can, we can have a lot of disagreement about the, the geography, the borders, the uh, security arrangement, but the two nations, they're still supporting the two-state solution. I think we are fed up of the old uh, classical European uh, role of photo opportunity or the peace tourism, bringing the Palestinians and the Israelis together. It didn't help because the Palestinians were, ca were coming f with their package of trying to force the Israelis to accept their uh, national right and to support uh, their national right and to have the sympathy for their cause. I think this was the wrong approach. The Israelis, they were delivering one message. They were already engaged in the peace process. And they, they, he, all these dialogues were important when it's related to the constructive action plan. Uh, you know, this atom, dealing with urban planning, dealing with water issues, environment, architects, uh, lawyers, media, young uh, professionals. This was, they were all positive. And I was part of an evaluation report to UNESCO, and one of the conclusions of the people-to-people people that 
it was mainly focusing on the dialogue for the sake of dialogue, less on the substance, on the framework, on a timetable, on achievement. And it was very uh, related to the position of each side. So we get the convinced Israelis, the same faces, the Peace Now camp, which is even more difficult today. I mean, they are in a minority. They are in, in the edge of the edge of the edge of the Israeli um, uh, political map. And with those Palestinians who want to convince the Israelis to support their national right as a precondition to engage in a dialogue and normalization. So we, we, we get the wrong approach by linking normalization with uh, linking this with the ending the occupation and supporting the national right, rather than linking this with empowering ourselves. No one can criticize me of going to the Hebrew University and getting the best education, or going to an Israeli hospital to get the best medical treatment, because we admire Israel as a technology, as a medical, as a university, as an education system, even Hamas. But when it's come to the political uh, and the, because of the physical and occupation and domination, it's a different mentality. And this is not fair to say it because we, the only image of Israelis is those soldiers and young kids who will tell us where to go and how to behave and where to stop and where to return back and etc. Because this is the only interaction with the military. With the, even we miss that, by the way, because all these checkpoints became very electronic technology one. You don't see soldiers, you just see, hear them shouting on you. Move to this side, move to that side, don't see anything. It's just a dark glass, they control things, they push the bottom, and you don't know who's talking to you. I said, I miss the occupation. <laughs> this is reality. I think we're still engaged in a professionals to professionals dialogue. This is very important. I think this part of the, of the world is very relevant. Singapore is a, an inspiring model. Uh, for the Palestinians, uh, and we can learn a lot uh, beyond the slogan of turning Gaza to Singapore. Uh, we can start doing something serious about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, please join me in thanking Mr. Asrala. We have coffee and tea and snacks outside, so you can continue this discussion. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thanks.